be copied or transcribed into two kinds of RNA, both more RNA genomes, which are the, the ones that are going to end up being packaged into the retrovirus, but also specific messenger RNAs, which make the proteins which either uh, are involved in the viral ref replication cycle inside the cell or are forming the coat that coats the viral RNA to lead to the budding off of additional infectious particles. And either these genomic RNAs or these specific messenger RNAs, again, are targets for ribozyme intervention. So where are we with this technology? Well, it works extremely well in the test tube, where you can control the concentration of ribozyme relative to RNA. When you try to get this to work on individual human cells growing in culture, there have been quite a number of reports of success, although once you get into a real living cell situation, it becomes much more difficult. And one expects that it's going to be yet more difficult to go to an actual infected human. Uh, there are clinical trials of ribozyme therapy for um, HIV that have been approved but have not yet been started in uh, Southern California area. And so it's going to be, I think, still a number of years before we can see how well this works uh, in terms of intervent intervening with an actual uh, virus infection uh, because clinical trials have to be carried out uh, over, uh, in a very careful and safe way over usually a fairly prolonged period of time. Uh, of course, the big problem with this sort of therapy is the delivery problem. This, these ribozymes, even though this particular one is a fairly small RNA compared with other cellular RNAs, it is still considerably larger than traditional pharmaceuticals. Uh, most drug companies go after chemicals that are under 500 in molecular weight. And if you think about that in terms of RNA, with 330 uh, mass units per nucleotide, you can see you can only get one and a half nucleotides of RNA and stay under this 500 um, molecular weight uh, limit. And so uh, clearly you need to uh, have a much larger drug if you're going to use RNA compared to a more conventional pharmaceutical agent. Uh, now, in the last uh, couple of years, a postdoctoral fellow, Bruce Sullinger, who now has his an independent faculty position at Duke University in North Carolina, has come up with a rather different way of using ribozymes to intervene in human disease. And this is using not the cutting activity of ribozymes alone, but instead the splicing activity, the ability to add another uh, portion of RNA to attach two RNA molecules together. And Solinger's idea uh, is that in many cases, an RNA molecule in the cell, you don't so much want to eliminate it, but it's mutated, and you want to, in principle, correct that defect in the RNA. Well, what would be an example of that? Well, there are many genetic diseases, including sickle cell anemia, where there's a mutation in one of the chains of the hemoglobin protein molecule that carries oxygen through the bloodstream. There's uh, other examples such as cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy, where RNAs are still being made, but the RNA has a mutation in it because the DNA from which, in the chromosome from which it was transcribed has a mutation. So the idea then is to design a ribozyme of this self-splicing type, but to uh, one that has a, a portion of it which can recognize a sequence on the mutant transcript that is preceding the damaged or mutant portion. And then this ribozyme, which we call a trans-splicing ribozyme, also uh, ca carries with it a downstream or three-prime exon, which is uh, uh, corrected, has this defect in the mutant transcript fixed. You can see the WT stands for wild type, which means that's the natural version that you would like to have that would correct the genetic deficiency. 
at the RNA level. And now, if these two can get together in cells, the ribozyme will catalyze the cutting off of the undesired or mutant portion of the transcript and the attachment of the correct portion, uh, as shown down below. And this RNA uh, should now be functional. Well, this technology works very well in the test tube, and we've also tried it in living cells, uh, not mammalian cells, but E. coli, the bacterium, and are able to uh, engineer a system in which we can take a, a, a defective, non-working RNA transcript and make a, a, a corrected uh, RNA out of it. You can think of this as sort of a molecular repair kit for fixing bad RNAs. You're simultaneously out with the bad and in with the good. There, of course, are many challenges uh, that need to be overcome in order to make something of uh, potential clinical usefulness from this basic science, and those include increasing the efficiency of the uh, splicing, which right now is rather inefficient, getting very high specificity to occur inside of living cells where there are a very large number of different RNAs that could potentially be rearranged by such a trans-splicing ribozyme. And then, uh, finally, the delivery problem again, and I think that's going to hinge on developments in gene therapy. These, these trans-splicing ribozymes are certainly going to be too large to be added, to be given to uh, a patient as a drug. It's going, they're going to have to be delivered in the form of delivering DNA, which then will be copied into RNA in the human cells, copied into this sort of trans-splicing ribozyme, which can uh, correct uh, transcripts from mutant genes. So uh, some exciting things to think about in the, in the future. I'm supposed to go to questions now, but I think it would be worth just a minute for me to recap uh, what I've uh, gone over in this second lecture. I told you a story, the story about uh, the discovery of the first catalytic RNA molecule, and I hope you saw that there was a lot of serendipity involved in that discovery that we uh, did not go looking for RNA catalysts, but in a sense, the RNA catalysts came looking for us, and we simply had to keep our eyes open at the right time. And then I told you that that basic science discovery had spin-offs in directions which were not at all on our mind at the time we were doing those experiments. We were driven by our curiosity to try to understand a life process unknown to us. There would be excitement generated both in the area of origins of life possibilities and also in the area of new approaches uh, for in medicine intervention in both viral disease but also non-viral disease coming from this uh, uh, what started out as the serendipitous discovery in basic research. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for another great lecture. Tomorrow morning will be the final two lectures given by Dr. Check in this series. We thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you here tomorrow. <laughs>